Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to worship. So glad to see all of you here this morning. And to anybody who's a visitor, we welcome you this morning also. And be sure to hang around for some treats and some fellowship time before you go home today. A couple of things uh, very briefly to talk about. Uh, first thing is the, the membership classes. You'll see that there's no sign up listed over at the, the board today for membership classes, but it's ongoing. If any of you still want to be members, you want to go through the membership thing to see Pastor Wayne and set up a private private meeting with you. So we'll just continue to do that until we've got everybody taken care of. If you would add to your prayer list, Gail Lemonhue, she's had some uh, surgery on her shoulder. She's very concerned about that. Just uplift her in your, in your prayers, if you would, please. And Jill. Come on, Jill. Jill has something to share. Well, Jill makes her way up here. Is there anything else anybody has to share this morning? We'll get that out now. Anything else to add? Go ahead, Debbie. She's got little Debbie in her neck and her shoulder. Okay, for, for Amy, who has pain in her neck and shoulder, add that to your prayer list. Okay, thank you, Debbie.
singing with me, and the women are going to be singing with Mackenzie. All right, so in the echo, men were singing first, women were singing second. Here we go. Thank you. 
School this week. Yeah. Any kids need prayers this week? Yeah. Any teachers need prayers this week? Yes, okay. Okay. Well, okay. I'm going to call that on the prayer request. Feel free to pray throughout the week because there's a lot to pray about. Amen. Okay, let's go to the words together. Lord Jesus, we rejoice with the opportunity to come before the living God, the one who created everything, the one who sustains everything, the one who sent his son into the world to save us from our sins, from the penalty of death, and the one who is with us all the time. We're thankful that you hear our prayers and that you answer them all according to your will. As we come as your people, we have an infinite number of needs. So we pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayers today, that you would turn your face toward us, and that you would answer these prayers according to your will and in a way that would glorify your name and strengthen your people. Lord, we ask that you'd be with Lewis's mom, uh, Ruthie, as she undergoes surgery to take pressure uh, and fluid off of her brain. Lord, we pray that you would be present with her, that she would take confidence and have faith in you. We pray that you would do a work through the physicians. We pray for Gloria's dad, Warren, and we pray that you would give him strength. We pray that you would fortify him for all that is required of him in these days. We pray for the whole family that you would take away fear, that you would give peace that goes beyond understanding in a time where the whole family leans upon you. We pray that you'd be with Gail and you as her surgery has been completed on her shoulder, that you would give her strength, give her patience, Lord, as the long healing process has begun. We pray that you give her wisdom and how she, how she continues to undergo therapy and the things that she's not supposed to do. We pray that she wouldn't do it. Lord, we pray for Sydney as the doctors have given a very good report of how things have gone and yet have given caution that the slightest bump can open things up in her fragile palate. God, we pray that you would protect her, that you would surround her with heavenly angels, that you would just gird uh, protection around her so that the healing that has begun would, would continue. We pray that the anxiousness of Colleen and knowing the fragileness of the surgery would be taken away, knowing that, that Sydney is in your protective hand. Lord, I pray that you continue to heal Vern too with his ribs and his shoulder as, as uh, he recuperates from his injury. We pray, Lord, for uh, Amy this morning as she's in a lot of pain from her, her neck and back. Um, not sure exactly the, the cause of that, but it seems to be reoccurring from chronic pain in the past. And with that comes a lot of fear and anxiety. Pray that you do for this morning. Lord, we pray that you would uh, be with Tim's daughter as she is, will be looking for a place to live here in our community. We don't know where they're going to live, but you know we know that there's a place that you preordained for them. We pray that you would make that provision known, and we will give you glory in advance of what you're going to do. Pray for Chris and Heather as they've already returned from the mission field for a brief 10 days of decompression of hard service in the field of mission. We pray a restoration time for them both. We pray that they would rest in you, that you would be encouraged by your people. We're thankful for the provision of a home. And we pray for the children to adjust well to school. We pray that you would provide them with good friends, provide them with comfort in a new place and the transitions of going from one culture to the next, that would be smooth and even seamless. As we pray for them in school, we pray for all the kids that are going to be returning to school, uh, even college students, Lord, as they, they travel and leave in these days. We pray that you would not just help them to learn, but that they would have their character developed as they walk with you. We pray for teachers, too, as they reacclimate to the classroom. 
We pray your richest blessing on them as they, they educate some of our kids and other children. Give them a love that comes from you that transcends the subject that they teach. Give them the patience that they need and the skill set that, that is required to train the next generation. In this, Lord, we pray for parents as well as they send their children back to school. The transition time that all of us are in, we pray uh, that we would lean upon you. That in the altering of schedules, that you would help us to keep our disciplines with you. Help us to spend time with you, seek you in prayer, walk with you. And help us to train up our children the way they should go so that when they grow old, they will not depart from it. God, we ask that you would prepare us for your word today. Many of us don't know the word you have, but it's specifically intended for us. We pray that we would be encouraged, that we would be blessed, that we would be strengthened, and that we would receive joy as a result of your good word and the hope that we have in Christ. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Let's prepare our hearts to receive the morning offering today. Sometimes we don't always prepare for the offering in advance, and it just kind of comes in a worship service. So I pray that the Lord would remind us all of his good gifts. For we know that anything that we give back to God, he has first given to us. That we give rejoicing and praises for what he's done. That we give of our resource, and that we give of our very self. So as we receive the offering today, let's be mindful of all those things.
when we take the look, take a look at a newborn child, we look at the change of seasons, we see his wonders all around. So let's join together in praising his name for how awesome and how great our God is. Let's stand together.
just like to share that the message from last week on God opening the eyes of the man that was born blind, there are more outlines at the information booth. If you don't have one yet, I was asked uh, about printing off some more. So if you didn't get that last week or if you forgot to grab one on your way out, I know that was a pretty meaningful message and the notes are helpful in your follow through. So feel free to pick that up. Also, I want to challenge you with what's to come. Next week, we're going to be receiving the message on Jesus raising Lazarus. So if we, as we get to the end of the series on Jesus' miracles, what greater miracle could there be than the resurrection from the dead? You know, it's one thing someone gets sick and you pray over them and their fever leaves. And you think, well, that's pretty something. But as you, as you consider miracles, raising people from the dead, the miracles that we're looking at right now kind of step up, the raising of Jairus' daughter, and then raising the, the widow's son who was dead, and they're on the way to the funeral, and then Lazarus, who was already in the grave for four days. It just, Jesus ramps up his miracles to an incredible degree. That's the text we're going to discover next week. After that, I'm going to enter into a new series. The Lord's really laid it on my heart to preach on revival. How many of you would desire to have revival in our land? Can I hear an amen on that? I mean, we're living in such days of, of wickedness and, and violence and lawlessness, and it's just overwhelming. And the answer to these things are not a new politician or not a new law or not a new way, but to return to the Lord. And one thing is certain of revival. Revival always starts with us. It always starts with God's people. And so I would encourage you to begin preparing for that by reading the book of 2 Chronicles. Read 2 Chronicles. And I'll be reminded again next week, but the, the verse that outlines what revival is is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Does anyone know that verse by heart by chance? If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their prayers and restore their land. So that's that's the memory verse for the series. So you can feel free to get a jump start on that. I know your heart will be blessed if you do so. But that, that's not, oh, wait a minute, an invitation about the revival series. This might be you, or this might be a friend of yours. But throughout the history of God's people, there are people who go wayward from Him. They forget about Him. Though they might acknowledge the great things that He's done for them, like we just sang about, they are contented not to walk in His way or honor Him as He deserves, but they just go away. These are the people that are called to be revived. Those who once had life who don't live in that vitality any longer. All of us know people who know God's goodness, know His grace, and His love for them, yet go astray. And so I would ask that we as God's people pray for them by name. Lift them up. If this is you, then this series is especially for you. But all of us know people who don't have the vitality that they once had that need this message. Pray for them. Invite them to come along to hear God's word in this because this is the mystery of life, that God by His grace would draw us back to Himself when we don't deserve it. I'm really getting psyched out. I really had a difficult time focusing on the message this week because I'm preparing the message out ahead, but I've got two awesome miracle sermons to go before we get there. So let's start with the first one. And it start, I'll have you turn to Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Now this miracle is identified as Jesus raising from the dead Jairus' daughter. Before we go there, I want you to think of some of the troubles we've got. Some of the difficulties. Some of them we prayed up already this morning. Our list of troubles is long and distinguished, isn't it not? We've looked at a number of the miracles that Jesus has done. 
and they're pretty awesome. Each one of us has our own weaknesses of the flesh, things that we desire to be healed from, whether it be the, the blind man that stumbles around with a stick, a person that is lame and cannot walk, or in this case, we'll, we'll be reading in this particular story of a woman that had a secret ailment for seven years that wasn't broadcast, but she carried day in and day out. All of them that were brought to Jesus, he healed. Every single one. We can come to the Lord with our burdens, but I want to ask you this question. Would there be any as great as seeing your child on their deathbed? This is a big one. All these things we deal with, with maybe a bitter taste in our mouth, or a hardship, or a pain in our suffering. But few things are greater than the death of the young. Lord meets us at our place of misery. Let's read God's word again. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Let's pause right here just for a moment. As we consider this particular thing, when you're leaning, when you're on the edge of this kind of trial, it's pretty hard not to fear that which is to come. I'm sure as he was on his way to meet Jesus, he's filled with hope and anticipation, but on the back side of that hope is the fear that his little daughter is going to die. We're told by, uh, by Luke that she was 12 years old. 12 year old girl. So as you're on your way, you're probably thinking about the hugs. You're thinking about the word, Daddy. Fearing what it would be like for the room to be silent and not hear those feet in the house anymore. And he comes to Jesus and Jesus starts on the way. So you can almost, there's hope. There's the possibility of things turning around. And on the edge of that, there's this huge crowd that is pressing him. I'm sure in his heart, he would be wanting the crowd to get out of the way. Jesus is coming to my house to bring life and save my daughter from death. And he's, he's bound by the crowd. And as they work through the crowd, something happens that causes Jesus to stop. A large crowd followed and pressed in around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it, and then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, let's deal with this rather quickly. Throughout the miracle accounts, we find that faith is an integral part. Sometimes it's the individual, sometimes it's someone else who is interceding for the individual. 
And sometimes it is God's development of a future faith in that person, but faith always has a plan. Here we have a woman that had a great need, and she was seeking with great faith, and she was healed, and the power of God went out without Jesus even saying anything, because in him is that healing power. And that conduit of faith opens God's healing power to this woman. Now, while it's an entirely different miracle, we can see that Jesus, on the way to do something according to another person's will, is delayed to help someone else. Now, there are many times in life where we have God's steps all planned out. Amen? We think that God is going to do what we ask because we define that as a good thing. And the Lord may well do that good thing in God's time. We find a similar event happening of next week's message where he raises Lazarus from the dead. He gets word that Lazarus is deathly ill. But he doesn't go. He waits. He waits until after he's in the grave to come. And when he, when he arrives, both Mary and Martha, Lord, if you had only come then, but didn't we find that when Jesus did come in his time that a greater miracle was performed? A greater need? There are many times in our life where God allows us to walk through the suffering, to feel the thorn, so that he can do a greater work than we would script. Friends, oftentimes, if we were to write out God's plan, it would be scribbled. Keep in mind that God is weaving together Something far greater than you could ever, ever create on your own. You think you could paint a good picture of God? Well, you wait and see what God has done. We think we might know what the glory of heaven is like. And yet it's going to be farther and, and, and wider than any comprehending thing on this planet. And sometimes in God's timing, in His providence, the extremity of our pain is the very thing that God wants to do a work in. And in the moment, we think, well, it couldn't get any worse than this, could it? But how much do we long for God in those moments, whereas when things are good, we don't reach up or even look up to Him at all? God does a work throughout. And God doesn't pass by someone so that He can get to our need in the moment's notice. God isn't Santa Claus. He doesn't answer all of our requests according to just how we want. He will either fix us, restore us now, or he will sustain us and give us strength to bear up under what we are in at the moment. Sometimes we script God's will for him and say, well, surely it is your desire that this happened. We have to be careful of that and guard ourselves of it. And then some news comes. Jesus has been delayed. Granted, he was doing something good. But now a bad word comes. Hmm. Verse 32. Oh, no. Let's try 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Now, at this moment, you can imagine that his entire countenance would fall. It is too late. The door is shut. There's nothing that can be done anymore. He's left only with his grief. He didn't say anything, but Jesus says, ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Imagine how your fears would usher in at that moment. Your daughter's dead. You're never going to hear her voice again. You're not going to see her grow. The dreams of her growing up and becoming married and living a full life and interacting with her all those days, 
the, the fear of not having grandchildren. This is his only daughter. All these fears. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Jesus says to Paul when he prays for his thorn to be removed, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, I don't know if you've already gone ahead of the message or not, but as if you've sat through this whole series through the summer, you know that every miracle is redemptive. And every miracle in the scriptures is also a sign. It's not just a wonder. It's not just, it's a sign. What does the sign of Jesus taking somebody from the death into life mean? He is the one that has power over death. Ultimately, the resurrection points to our future. Every Christian who has Orthodox faith believes in the resurrection of the dead. That one day the dead in Christ will rise, that we will see him face to face, that we will be in heaven with him. All these miracles of resurrection point forward to that which is promised to all of us. Every other healing is temporary. If, you, if you're sick and the Lord restores you, that's a temporary deal. Death is going to come no matter the age, 12 years old, or in the next text that we look at, a young man. All of us have to be prepared at any moment for this to come. And he says, don't be afraid. When we live in faith that the Lord Jesus has paid for our sins, we do not have to be afraid of death. We read recently in, in the past weeks of of Christian children that are literally being killed and martyred and parents are being left to live from Islamic terrorists. They go in and they're asking the children, do you recant your faith? And the children are saying, we believe in Jesus and being killed in front of their parents' eyes. Here's another spiritual truth here. An application. Every parent who loves their children should do everything possible that Jesus would come to their house and touch them. It should be the biggest priority we've got in life. It's a great joy to see a child born, but a greater still that they be born again, that they have an eternal life with Christ. All of our prayers, all of our efforts ought to be dedicated and directed to this end. Because death comes to us all with, without forewarning. There is no notice. And we don't know what is going to happen later. I'm mindful of uh, a young girl that was in my youth group years ago. Who was 11 years old. She went to summer camp accepted Jesus as her savior at that Christian camp and on October 31st of that fall she went on a hayride and on that hayride the person that was steering the tractor just wanted to make that ride a little bit more exciting and went off trail and when he went off trail the pin came out of the trailer and it went down the hill and she flipped over forward in that trailer and it rolled over her chest and that 11 year old girl breathed her last and as she did she spoke of not having fear because Christ was in her heart now I ask you what comfort would you have as a parent besides that on that day. You would. And so this is something that all of us as parents need to strive to do for our children. Introduce them to Jesus. Get Jesus to touch them for without Him they won't live forever. Now verse 37, He did not let anyone follow Him except Peter, James, and John the brother of James, when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler. Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly, which we would expect. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. Yeah. 
See, people laugh at Jesus a lot. They laugh at the thought of him. It says, after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother, the disciples were with him, and went in where the child was. Now, I want you to pay attention to what the Lord did here. He took all the mockers, and he took all the scoffers, all the people that had no faith, and he put them out of the room. Put them out of the room. The faithless out there. The faithful in here. Now watch what the Lord is going to do. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Now see how many more English words it takes to do this than in Arabic? Two words here. Rise up. Now you will find in the next two miracles too, the raising of the widow's son and the raising of Lazarus Anyone know what he said to Lazarus? Anybody tell me? He st it starts with Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Now that is straight to the point. He doesn't work around the energy, get energy up in the room, stand up before the people and, and get everybody into a wild thing and then have to repeat something over and over and over and over to make it happen. The miracles of Elijah and Elisha that, that parallel this and the resurrection of, of the dead and giving life back was a grand ceremony of back and forth and back and forth and intercession and laying on them and touching them and da, 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 all this stuff before it finally happened. Why? Because they were instruments of God's power. Jesus is the power himself. All it takes is a word. He doesn't labor at this at all. All he does is take her hand and say, time to get up, little girl. And immediately she does it. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Why did she need something to eat? Because she needed strength. She's been dead. Now, I want to have a little bit of an aside here for a moment. When you read God's Word on your own, when you study God's Word for your own nourishment, I want to encourage you to read God's Word devotionally. Now, what I mean by this is when you come to God's Word, never be content with learning something new. Sometimes we think, well, that I had a really good study this morning because I learned this. Learning something doesn't do anything to change your heart. Amen? So when you read God's word, look for how the Lord would have you put it into practice. Ask the questions. What lesson do you have for me today, Lord? Is there something you would have me do in response to your word today? Is there a promise that I need to claim? Is there something that I need to go and do? Is there something I need to confess? Is there a promise for me to claim? Is there something for me to praise you for? Respond to God's word. Have your heart be soft and say, God, shape me with your word today. For without it, we just get into a religious practice of doing religious stuff and we end up not changing. This little girl went from dead to alive. And they were astonished. They were in awe. He gave them strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And we know from the other accounts that they spread the word all over the place. Maybe the affirmation is, God, I need to be sensitive to what you tell me to do, so I do it exactly, not doing things my way. Jesus had work to do yet. Okay, let's get to the next miracle. Shall we? Okay, we're going to turn the page and we're going to go to Jesus rang, raising the widow's son, which is in Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 11. Now, this miracle that we just read about, Jesus put all the people that were out of faith out of the house. He comes into solitude and he, he raises her up in the privacy of a home. This miracle person's been dead already, probably for a while. 
It says in this text, coffin. I want to, I, before I even read the text, I want to tell you that, that back in that day, they didn't have coffins like we do today. It wasn't a wooden box or something that was sealed up. They, they carried the dead on something more like a gurney. It was, it was a flat piece of wood with edges so that you don't fall off in some cases. In other cases, it was, it was more like a, a basket weaved article that would just hold the body. Not like a basket, but the, it would be weaved so that they would have several people carrying it. So Jesus is walking down the street. He's got a multitude around him with his disciples and people that want to be healed and all this, and he's going into town of Nain, and, and this company is coming out. So Jesus and his company is going one way, the funeral procession is going the other direction, and they meet. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him, and he approached the town gate. As he approached it, a dead person was being carried out. Just like today, we don't bury people in the middle of town. Look for a field or a place to go. Now, I want you to just ponder these words for a moment. The only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Consider it. Only son of his mother. And she was a widow. Just that brief description is loaded. When we lose our spouse, we go through a period of lostness, of emptiness. We lose our confidant. We lose the person that we discuss things with. We lose intimacy. We lose strength. And more so a woman than a man. She'd already lost one leg of the stool, so to speak. And now she loses her grown son as well. And a large crowd from the town was with her. I want to give you a description of a procession. Now when we drive, we see the flags on a vehicle in front. We know that a funeral procession is coming, and sometimes we stop and we wait it to go by. How many of you would go up and stand out in front and stop the funeral procession and knock on the door of the hearse and say, Hey, I'd like to have a conversation with the dead? Doesn't happen. The procession is interrupted, but he comes with such peace and power, they stop still. For him. There is no request. Jesus ministering to this woman comes from his compassion and his compassion alone. That's it. There's no request. Think about this for a moment. In our sin, in our depravity, God sent his son into the world not because we recognized our desperate state and said, God, we need help. He sent his son because he loved us and has compassion for us in our plight. There was no request. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Another way to say this is he had compassion on her. And said, don't cry. Don't cry. Now her response is, don't cry. What? People are, people are mourning. In a procession like this, there would be literally hired mourners. People that do it professionally. In the in Eastern worlds, this is what they do. They, they hire people that play flutes. They hire people that do mourning songs to mourn for them when they run dry of it themselves. You ever cry so much you have no more tears to shed? You just don't, you don't have any more. They dry up. And you just sob. And to express the mourning, they bring people in to do it for them. It's an outward expression of their inner heart. This is a foretaste and a promise of what is to come. Remember, all of Jesus' miracles are redemptive. All of them are a sign. When we mourn death, he says, 
don't cry. According to the Thessalonians, we are not to mourn in the same way as others mourn. Why? Because in death, we have victory. Jump fast forward to Revelation chapter 21. He will dry every tear. For death is no more. The old has passed away. This death, this pain, these difficulties, Jesus is pointing to what he came for. He came to put an end to it all. Then he went up and he touched the coffin or the carrying board. And those carrying it stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, get up. Then that man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Life was given back of that which was taken away. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to his, help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Now this woman was having grief upon grief, and if you know anything about grief, it's never completely gone. We work through what they call stages of grief, but when we have fresh death, we're reminded of what we've lost when we haven't worked through before. Many of you have experienced this. Sometimes when you go to a funeral for someone that you care about, you are refreshed in what you feel about someone else that you lost because that isn't completely gone yet. Our grief is not completely healed until we see Jesus face to face and it's all put down. When we read this devotionally, is there something to praise? Is there something to confess? Is there something to commit? What conviction is there? I want to I want to narrow some thinking into a specific area of application. Young men, young women, young or old, it doesn't matter. Let's suppose you are the person that Jesus touched and brought back to life. Now what? The page of scripture is blank on this issue. It said that he began to speak, he began to talk. Maybe he had said something to his mother. We don't know what he said. But let's just follow our imagination here for two possibilities. One, Jesus gave this man a new lease on life, gave him life when he was dead, and he chose not to do anything for Jesus for the rest of his days. Imagine that for a moment. It's not so hard for us to imagine because people do it all the time. Sometimes we're raised up in the faith, raised up in the church. We know the truth. We know Jesus shed his blood to pay for my sin so that I can have victory over it. But I'm content to go sin all day long, day after day after day. To live amongst those who don't even know God. To participate in things that I know are an affront to God and do not glorify His name. It happens every day. Let's consider the alternative. People that began to praise Him. This is a prophet. What good is it for a person that is raised from the dead from a prophet who has new life, but they don't listen to the words of the prophet? It doesn't do you anything at all. The words of the prophet are repent, be obedient. The words of this prophet said, love one another. Those who love me obey my commandments. Follow me. Get rid of the junk. These are the words of the prophet Jesus. He says, I came to give life and life to the full. 
Why would you be content doing the devil's labors when you have the opportunity to give glory to the living God? And this is what I mean about reading devotionally. Put yourself in the situation. Say, now what would God have me do? Make it personal. After all, this is God's love, love letter to his children, so let's read it as his kids. Put it in practice. What reward would be forfeited this man if he turns his back on Jesus after being given new life? I want, to, I want to close with the big picture of the miracles of the resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ gave up the glory of heaven as the only begotten son in both these stories, only daughter, only son, single child. And you have a grieving parent in each case. And both were restored to life to give glory to God. The Lord Jesus was sent by his Father to come into this world to die for us so that we could have light. Heaven came down, literally, to touch us so that we could live. We're going to close out our worship service by singing Heaven Came Down. I invite you to turn to hymn number 495. And after we sing it, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and receive the benediction. 495. Let's stand to sing.
worthy of the offer of that grace he did offer. I don't usually use those kind of words. Or riches eternal, blessings supernal. I don't usually use those words either. But what do you try to how can we say what God has done? Using your words. Do you realize that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, that transaction that is described in this text that happens in an instant is no different than when Jesus says, young woman, stand up. Young man, get up. Lazarus, come forth. It happens just like that. It's not a labor. It's not us doing something so that we get to a point where God finally says, okay, you've earned your way in. By God's grace, he touches our heart and we receive something of such great value it is incomprehensible in just a moment's notice. As we leave this place today, celebrating the goodness of what God has done, consider that he has chosen you to give life. And when we leave today, we have the opportunity to live it for His glory and for His honor. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.